Okay, guys, we are here today um, with Lyndall Rowe, who is a teacher at uh, Pulaski Tech. He is a philosopher. And as the meetup description said, we're here to talk about the meaning of life. Now, who in this crowd has read anything by Douglas Adams? Oh, please, more of you than that. I will have Douglas who? I know you haven't read anything. You have literate buffoon. <laughs> Okay, has anybody in here watched any Monty Python movies? Because there's a big one about the meaning of life. Okay. But uh, Mr. Rowe is going to talk with us about all kinds of issues, and he's going to challenge us. He's promised a challenge. Rudy's here, so, you know, there ought to be a really good dialogue. Not that I'm drawing attention to you or anything. She, she's already warned me about you, actually, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over to Lyndall Rowe. Thank you very much. So how is everybody today, okay? Uh, you know, the title, uh, The Meaning of Life, that's kind of a daunting title, isn't it? Right? Um, it's sort of an arrogant title, right? As if I'm going to come in here uh, and convey to you the meaning of life in an hour, hour and 15 minutes or so. Uh, but um, I don't think that's my project, actually. Um, uh, it's, it's something probably less, gr less grandiose. Uh, I suspect that... Uh, many, many of you are already sort of nihilistic in your views. In other words, uh, being exposed to science and logic and reason, uh, you tend to turn away from re religious belief, and as a result of that, uh, you tend to not have a prevalent teleological view of humanity. You guys, are you familiar with the term teleological? Uh, this is a word that I might use here and there, so let's make sure we're, we're clear on what that means. Uh, this is a Greek word uh, that is used in a lot of different ways uh, in, in the history of philosophy. There's, there's the teleological argument, for instance, for God's existence. Uh, but the root word here uh, is a Greek word, telos, and that, that word usually translates as purpose or design, so uh, a real, really familiar proof for God's existence, right, uh, from the religious believer's viewpoint, is uh, the universe looks very structured and ordered. Uh, you know, opposable thumbs and DNA and photosynthesis don't happen on their own. Uh, so there must have been a grand designer that's vastly more intelligent, vastly more powerful than we are, and so that must be a god, right? And so from the religious believer's viewpoint, the universe is fundamentally teleological. It has purpose. It looks as if it's designed by an intelligent being. And so secular folks tend to, uh, to disavow that viewpoint or tend to think that that way of looking at the world is sort of primitive and uh, inaccurate. Uh, but what I've learned over the years is that even people that are, that are highly informed and very uh, empirical and analytical and, and scientific in their way of looking at the world still have the remnants of a teleological view of reality. And so it takes a lot of effort and uh, a lot of uh, personal discourse to self-evaluate and find out whether you've gone down that path. And so part of the project today will be to see if we actually can come across some exam examples where... Uh, we, we ourselves have done that. I find myself using teleological language all the time. Uh, I'll give you some simple examples just from the beginning, right? Um, what's, the, uh, what's the function of the heart? What's the heart, what's the heart for? Right, so circulate, right? Uh, what about uh, teeth? Purpose of teeth, what do they do? Right, the technical word for chewing, right? Uh, what about... Uh, Posable thumb, like I said before, what's, what's it for? It was a parent. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's, that's me. Um, so look, you guys, nobody contested my choice of language there. The function of the heart is to pump blood. Uh, the purpose of the teeth is to chew, right? Uh, the thumb is for picking things up. Uh, those, those are not accurate descriptions, not from a secular view. The heart's not functioning for anything. There's no function. Function assumes there's a wider system that it plays a role in. Right? Uh, the teeth aren't for chewing. They don't have a purpose unless you believe the world is uh, teleological. Uh, and it's not just in the biological science, sciences. I mean, you see this quite often in journal articles and so on. Very, very obvious teleological language. And it has a lot of pedagogical use, right? I mean, um, you, can, uh, you can tell somebody about how the body works a lot easier if you talk about it in a teleological way. Uh, but uh, is it accurate how the universe is? We'd have to have evidence that it's for pumping blood, uh, that the teeth are, are here for the purpose of chewing and so on. But it, inf it infects other uh, branches of science, right? 
Uh, the genetic code. You guys ever hear about this, right? We're going to unravel the genetic code. There's no code. There's no code. No one encoded information into reality. The solar system, there's no system. It's just stuff swirling around, right? And so th those are all uses of teleological language. It's pervasive. And so even people that are informed and intelligent oftentimes uh, see the universe as having some sort of subtle meaning. M maybe not the, the grand meaning that the religious believer has, but it's very similar in its structure. And so what I want to do is, once again, look at ways that we might be able uh, to avoid that. avoid that. So let's start in a place that doesn't seem so obvious, but I think if you think about it for very long, uh, you'll see the connection here. Ethics, morality. Right? We all have to deal with this on some level, either more or less. I suspect with this group, less. <laughs> Right? Um, okay, so let's start with just rudimentary examples. Who in here thinks that it's morally wrong to uh, extinguish cigarettes on small children for fun? <laughs> just for entertainment purposes. Oh, it depends on the child, yeah. <laughs> clearly, clearly you haven't met my child then. Uh, he would enjoy it, that's the problem. Um, okay, so who, who in here thinks that it's uh, more, yeah, he's a little, he's a little uh, masochistic, there's no doubt. Uh, so who in here thinks it's morally wrong to make and eat baby burgers? Infants grind them up into patty consistency. Uh, they'd be delicious. You know they would, right? Um, only thing that might be better would be unicorn burgers, but since we can't find one, uh, we may have to stick to infants. So morally wrong to eat babies? I mean, I, you know, barring weird circumstances where you crash on the side of a mountain and there's nothing else left to eat and the baby dies first, right? Let's, uh, we're saying go and get a live infant right now, grind it up. Get all the condiments. We're make a it. Of atheists. We're accused of eating babies all the right, right, yeah, yeah. Because we have no moral code, right? So <laughs> the first thing we would do is eat babies. Uh, okay, so you can buy the, pills. the no, the pills. What pills are we talking about here? I'm intrigued. What? Uh, oh, you mean ground up babies? You're saying? And so was this medicinal? Did people use this for some? Oh, no, they're cra crazy about capitalism these days, right? Um, okay, so uh, why are those things morally wrong? I mean, everybody, this is pretty universal. No one here really wants to eat babies or torture little children, right? Uh, not even Republican children, <laughs> right? So uh, why, is it, why is it morally wrong to do those things? Fundamentally, on the bottom basement level, that's the question the philosopher's concerned with. Why is it wrong? Let's just pick one example. Why is it wrong to torture little children? This is an actual question. It's not rhetorical, right? This is... <laughs> Cause of suffering. Cause of suffering. Okay, so why is it wrong to induce suffering? See, all you've done is you've traded out one moral principle for a broader one, right? And so I want to know then why is it wrong to <laughs> induce suffering? Uh, why do I have to uh, have a universal moral principle? You're giving me the golden rule with some other stipulations, right? Why do I have to follow the golden rule? Why is that a principle I have to subscribe to? You're just, you're just giving me more and more moral principles. I want to know fundamentally, bottom basement level, what makes something wrong or right. Go for it. The, uh, you don't have to raise your hand. Just wrong. it's a free for all, right? Group's decision that that's the way it should be. Just so we group. we just got together as a culture and said, hey, no eating babies, no torturing little kids. Is that just, is this where the moral system gets its justification? So this sort of sympathy thing, right? You, you, I think there's a rational basis for morality that is actually to my interest to not do things like this because human beings are essentially social. I cannot live without being a social being. And these things would undercut any ability of any human being to be a social being. Right, so... But, there is a rational basis for morality. It isn't arbitrary. That's part of why... All cultures forbid murder in some definition anyway. But, but look, just because there's a universal uh, moral belief about murder, right? Uh, or that uh, we, we, we're, all, we're all social creatures perhaps I'm by nature. That's why I'm saying that the reason is because it would undercut any ability for human beings to live and anything that is... Yeah, but why, should, why, why do I... I have, no, I have no fundamental obligation to care about living. Right? I, I have no fundamental obligation to care about living. I might, by my nature, I might really like not to suffer. I might really like to be social and so on. I might have sympathy and compassion. But it still doesn't tell me on a fundamental bottom basement level that that's the right or wrong thing to do. Now, if you say it's grounded in rationality, I'm intrigued. That sounds Kantian in some way. There have been several people who 
put out versions of why there is a rational basis for morality. Yeah, based on yeah, lots. Biology and psychology. Okay, so now, you, man, you've gone straight to where I wanted you to. Thank you very much. Uh, look, just because our biological nature is a particular way, it does not imply anything about our moral obligations. Does that make sense? Let's go, uh, for example, with, well, you have, the only satisfactory answer I've, I've, I've had so far, which I don't like it, but uh, the idea that society is generating morality just as an arbitrary decision, which is called ethical relativism, I, I, I don't like that theory particularly, but no one else has given me any justificatory scheme. You have not given me a meta-ethical scheme. You just said, well, there's a rational basis in there and people have done it. I'm not picking on you particularly, but I'm simply saying that uh, the only one of you that gave me any answer to what backed up ethics was him. And he was my ex-student. Good for you. Right? <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's cheating a little bit. It's a plan. We brought him in here. Thank you. Societies make up arbitrary rules. There's no more justification. Well, I, but look, well, you're... I, I, say, here's a rational, biological, psychological... I know, but look, let, let's think about... Uh, who in here thinks homosexuality is morally wrong? No one. That's what I would expect. Now, why? Go ahead. Give me the biological arguments. Talk about the genetic basis. We've all seen nobody, the studies. Nobody knows well, there's some pretty good. There, there are some pretty good genetic studies now. There was an Italian study in 08 and so on. At a biological, like say, at an evolutionary level, the reason for it, it is known to be near universal or valid. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And Desmond Morris made arguments years ago and so on. So he's killing your own kind. Yeah. 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 There's no way to know. Anytime we're looking back in terms of an evolutionary model, we have no idea what the actual reason for an evolutionary adaptation was. We're just guessing. If you say homosexuality played the role in hunter-dweller times of uh, facilitating uh, pair-bound females when the males were off hunter-gathering, right? Awesome. That's a neat theory. That's a possibility. Desmond Morris has made those arguments. But there's no way to ever know that. We can't transport our ourselves back to that sociological condition. There are always ad hoc explanations. Any sociological explanation of what, why we evolve the capacities that we do will always be ad hoc. We're, we're guessing in those particular circumstances. Well, then that's what I'm talking about in a teleological way of looking at the world. I'm saying, I'm saying that some of these theories are testable, and they ought to be if they're real bias. Evolutionary biology is testable in a retrospective sense, but it's not testable in the traditional sense. And I don't want to get onto this tangent of whether we uh, can validate evolutionary. It doesn't make any predictions. What are the predictions of evolutionary theory? Science makes predictions. Einstein said there'd be a deviation in the perihelion of uh, Mercury and we'd be able to see stars that we wouldn't be capable of seeing because of time-space curvature around the gravitational field of the sun. We went and tested that, and if it weren't true, Einstein's theory would have been falsified. Evolutionary biology doesn't make any predictions. It doesn't make a single specific prediction. They're, they're retrodictive. What, give me a prediction, then. What, what, what's going to happen to giraffes? What's going to happen to giraffes? That you will never find rabbit fossils in the Carboniferous period. Right. Absolutely never. Right, but this it's one, a prediction. That, that, it's a prediction about something that already happened in the past. It doesn't tell me what's going to evolve in, in the future, right? You can never do that with evolutionary biology. They do that too. How, you, have, you have the ability to know where we're going to end up. Because there are mathematical models of evolution that do make predictions about the future. But you'd have to know what all the variables are in the universe to do that. I mean, I don't want to argue the dynamics of evolution necessarily, but I'm not convinced that it is a theory that parallels the other hard science theories. It's a very highly confirmed, useful model of explanation, but it doesn't have the predictive capacity that uh, physics or uh, chemistry or any of the other hard sciences have. It just doesn't. We, we can't expect to know what's going to happen with a, with a given species at any given time. We have the model to explain how that would happen, but that's very different than actually predicting the individual events, ultimately. But, but look, my concern, go ahead if you have a let, question. Yeah, let me interrupt right here because we, we're not getting any of the comments from the crowd on the mic, so let me run around and hand the mic out when you talk. I know it's going to slow stuff down. I'm sorry, but we need to do that. And there's somebody with a hand raised over there. Okay, so. Go for it. But look, look. Let me let me let me point out while we're doing that. Before we move on, uh, if you're going to give me biological or scientific arguments for uh, the basis of moral judgment, then you're back into the teleological mode. Do you see why that's the case? If you tell me that homosexuality is not morally wrong because we have a biological predisposition for sexual orientation, or if you tell me that cheating is not morally long, wrong because if you have a allele 334, you have a higher probability of cheating, which the studies show that too, by the way, right? So, uh, awesome. That still doesn't tell me what's right or wrong. All you've done is describe the world. Morality is prescriptive. 
not descriptive. And so everything we've talked about so far is descriptive of the universe. It is not prescriptive of the universe. And so what philosophers would accuse you, accuse you of, many of you, uh, would be that um, you're guilty of what's called the naturalistic fallacy. You're trying to derive value statements from factual statements. You're telling me how the world is. We have gay genes. We have cheating genes, right? Uh, therefore, X is wrong. And it just doesn't follow without adding in other moral prescriptions. You have to add in some moral judgment about what's right or wrong fundamentally. And so what I want to know on the bottom basement level, what backs up ethics? The question I ask once again, fu fundamental bottom basement level, what backs up ethics? So. Well, I, I think I would say that when you look at mo cases where there are moral issues, you look at what are the consequences for a society right. that you know, you have a society that says certain things are moral and other things are immoral, that, that society will have characteristics that may be, get more successful or less successful. Now, uh, but successful, also, is it, you know, just, let me just point out very quickly before we move survival. on. Survival. Successful is a definition. teleological term. No, right? it isn't. Yeah, it's it's goal-oriented. Does, does this culture disappear from the face of the earth? Survival it is, is gone. Survival is not a... a look, I understand no. that certain behaviors help us survive better than others, right? But that doesn't mean that they are right or wrong. You're still using uh, well, teleological I'm, thought on all I'm this. saying that the, the existence of the moral, of a particular moral law, either makes you more or le makes the society more or less likely to survive. Absolutely. That, and... and <coughs> The reason for this, for the near universal rule that that uh, killing other human beings is an act which has to be taken very seriously, and it's only under certain circumstances is it morally acceptable. That is something that is that in placing an importance on human life is something that virtually all societies have, and. But remember because. what I'm asking you, I'm asking you about the truth or falsity of meta-ethical claims, right? I understand that certain principles allow our society to well, function better than others. Not, not dis murder is not a good idea because if you murder indiscriminately, then you're not protected and society fails, we don't flourish, it collapses. I understand that, right? But I still do not have a justification for why murder is morally wrong other than it functions. Just because something functions doesn't mean that it's true or false. Just because something is useful doesn't mean that it's true. Well, uh, great, then you have to give me the bridge arguments, right? Just because something works, this is pragmatism, right? This is an American way of looking at philosophy. If it works, it's true. I mean, if I tell you to stay away from tigers because they shoot laser beams from their eyes, it will keep you from being eaten by tigers, but it's not accurate of reality. And so just, be, just because something works, it doesn't make it true. Yes, that's that, right, and we know that by going and investigating the tigers, right? And so I want to know, how do we investigate the fundamental truths of morality? You're giving, you're giving me normative moral principles. So, so go ahead. Go ahead. You're asking for something like a religious principle. No, no. Believe me, I'm not asking for that. Ethics, and yes. much of us, at least, are saying that, no, there is no such thing. Teleology is not wrong. Anything that's a living system is teleological. I don't understand we are that. I don't understand that statement. We are purpose seekers. You can describe oh, okay, the, I'm a math It behaves I teleological. Don't give a, a system theoretic description of something that has, is a purpose seeking system. Right. And I say that anything that destroys the ability of human beings to be teleological in the way that they are is what we're saying when we talk about morality. If this is automatically self destructive, to a society that advocates it, but, I mean, what it's, you're, uh, by definition, a wrong moral principle. What you're giving me, though, is a human nature argument like you gave me a minute ago. I understand that by our nature, we tend to impart value into things and seek and try to find uh, purpose and so on. I mean, I make a hammer have purpose. It hammers. It doesn't have purpose on its own. I impart the meaning to it. And so we can do that very easily. Uh, but that does not mean that there's genuine purpose there, right? Human nature arguments are very suspicious. It's, it's just like the biological argument. We have a nature, therefore morality ought to parallel our, our, our nature. It just doesn't follow. We can have a nature, and just to use the Christian model, right, our nature, according to Jesus, is, you know, should be one thing, right, but the commandments are another. Right? And so what I'm saying is that morality doesn't necessarily have to line up with what our nature is. You hope it does, but there may not be anything that's moral at all, in fact. Right. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
I love this is the way we regulate ourselves in here. Perhaps we have created purpose in ourselves. It's like Schrodinger's cat where you don't know if it's dead or alive till you look. Yeah. Because we exist, we give purpose to things. We give meaning. We establish it yeah, because we can talk yeah. about it. And that fits well with the relativistic model, right? And why is it wrong? I made it to be wrong. No, I don't like that one either. I think that's a type of pseudo-teleology, right? When you're saying that morality, what gives morality its fundamental basis is that folks just got together and made it up at some point in time, uh, that's still believing that there is some truth of the matter about what's right or what's wrong. This is what's at stake in this conversation, in terms of morality at least, right? To believe that there is some truth about what's right or what's wrong, on my view, is teleological. It's not teleological in the deep structural sense like the religious believer. It's pseudo-teleological, right? In other words, there's another way of looking at morality. What if there are no moral facts at all? When I asked you, is it morally right or morally wrong uh, to torture little children? Which, what an adequate answer might have been was, well, that's, that's a pseudo question, right? You're not really giving me a legitimate question because it's neither true nor false that it's morally right or morally wrong to torture little children, right? There are plenty of propositions that are not true or false. Uh, is, is it true or false that the present king of France is bald? Neither. There's no king of France. It ended badly. Right? So uh, now what if when you say murder is morally wrong, that's the same thing as saying is the present king of France bald? It's not a proposition that's either true or false. And that way you can escape committing yourself to truth value about morality. And when you do that, you don't import any purpose, right? Now, can you have moral beliefs under that model? Absolutely. But they wouldn't be anything other than conventional systems, like the law, right? The law is just a conventional system. Oftentimes, the law parallels our moral code. And so we do believe the law has some deep metaphysical basis. A lot of folks do. Uh, but what if the moral system itself is just a conventional system that has no truth value at all? And now, if that's the case, then you could escape the teleological view of reality. Now, let me point out, by the way, now, some, some of you folks said, well, you're looking for this religious model. Not by any means, because if you look at the religious model, think about it. The, the way the religious believer gets their justification here for purpose and for morality and so on is God imparts it to them. Right? Now, that's not a bad meta-ethical scheme at first, it seems, right? You've got a super powerful being. He loves you, creates universe, devises scheme, reward, and punishment. Just, I'm not, don't even worry about the evidence for it. Let's just pretend like we don't even, that doesn't even matter in this context. We're asking about whether it's a good justification for purpose and, and a meta-ethical substructure and so on. I mean, the smart person asks pretty quickly, okay, well, what gives that whole system meaning? Right? I mean, just because you have a super powerful being that makes it morality, that doesn't mean that you've given any purpose or meaning or moral substructure to reality. It just doesn't follow. And so the same thing goes for us. Just because we st this, is, this is just a model of ethical relativism, we're just the God in that case. Right? I stand here and I say, X is good. This is the ethical relativist model. Right? But that doesn't make it good. It doesn't make it true or false that it's good. Just because something, I'm going to ask, okay, what makes all that the way it is? It's the same question. I mean, a lot of times the secularist is a relativist. They believe that morality is made up by culture. This is the most common view within secular society about morality. It just doesn't work if you really are true to your beliefs as a secular person. You have to abandon that model too. And you have to abandon these biological justifications. I mean, I've heard these all, all day. Uh, Dawkins makes these arguments that somehow we can determine our moral structure by looking at what our biology is. Uh, that's a pseudo-teleological belief. Just because we have a given fundamentalist, fundamental biological drive, it doesn't tell me whether it's morally right or morally wrong. And so if somebody's going to tell me there is something that's morally right or morally wrong, I want to know what backs it up. Where, where, how, how are they made privy to that knowledge? I mean, I know how to find a scientific fact. I go and I look. I know how to find a mathematical fact. I use logic. How would I find a moral fact? I don't have my, my moral detector. I'm looking around, beep, 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 right? I mean, what, what do moral facts look like? Are they round? Are they square? Are they green? What do they smell like? Do they have, are they textured roughly? They don't have any properties. This is a strange claim. And so this is an example where I think that we have just been strongly influenced by this teleological view as a result of our nature and as a result of religion historically. And so even secular folks are tripped up by this. I mean, that's ultimately uh, the whole point of this discussion. Go ahead. I see somebody's wanting... Go for, go for it. Um, well, basically, what 
what you've been doing here is saying uh, we're going to throw away the more the the religious definition of what is morality, uh, but any other proposed definition of morality we're going to throw away too. That any other proposed definition of what is good, what is morality, you're just simply going to reject it because you say that it isn't based on something more fundamental. Why not simply take a definition of morality as being a social code or a social rule right. that has survival value and say that that is the definition of more, more well, I mean I, I was I was with you until you said survival value well I would right? say the survival yeah. value of a society if you have a society right. flourishing of in society which, and so on for yeah. example uh, killing of other human beings is a casual thing that is is of no consequence at all there will be consequences in that you know, of a society being right. that way, and it will make that society less capable to survive. Whereas a society in which human life is considered important, and that only under certain well-defined circumstances are people um, allowed under the rule right, to right. kill other human beings. Okay, and, and I'm fine. Then, think think then about this. If you, you, because you're basically saying, well, you can't observe it because, but you're not even de defining what morality is. You have to have a definition before you can reject the idea that something is the basis for morality or, or an observable fact of reality. You have to have a definition of what morality is. Well, I mean, I can start with a definition. I mean, let's just let me go from the back to the front of that of that comment, right? I mean, I can start with uh, murder is morally wrong, all right? I mean, I can start with a moral proposition. Well, just pick whichever one you want, right? Whatever moral proposition you want, and then I'm going to walk out into the world and try to figure out how I would ever verify that. Now, if you don't import a moral system with you when you go do that, you'll never have any success. Right, in other words, if I watch somebody kicking someone to death and I write down all the data, wincing, groaning, yelling, screaming, bleeding, I can interview him. Why, why are you beating him up? Oh, he stole my stuff. Uh, do you like being beaten up? No, I really hate it. I have all the data, right? And so I'm finished. Now, how do I decide whether it's morally wrong if I don't have some moral system to lay over that observation event? I, I, I can't. I can't. That, that's like, like doing moral science. If that were the case, philosophy folks would have given this up a long time ago. We just, we just let the sociologists do ethics for us. Now, they can tell us what each culture believes about morality, but there's no way to go out there and find the truth of it. So there's a way for me to try to investigate it. I can start with a moral proposition and go out and see if I can verify its truth or falsity in a non-sociological way. Now, I don't even know what that would mean. What, what would I look for? And, and so, I mean, I agree with you. When, the, the front of your comment, I absolutely agree. Uh, if you look at moral systems as conventionalist constructs, that have no truth value, then you have a reasonable secular position. But the moment you believe, the moment you believe that moral propositions have truth value, you have imposed something on the universe that doesn't exist. You were saying that it's true or false that it's morally wrong to eat babies. You were saying it's true or false that it's morally wrong to be gay. There's no truth value there. How, this is a strange claim. It's a pseudo-teleological claim. I call it pseudo-teleological because it's not as crazy as this one. This one's completely nutty. Right? But uh, it's still nutty that we believe that there are some, some things out there called moral facts or moral truths. Uh, what would those be? Now, some of you might think that this is a plausible position already, but my uh, experience has been that secular folks don't even see this possibility. They tend to gravitate towards relativism first. Uh, I think there's one further step. You have to go to what's called moral nihilism. Go ahead if you want to. Nobody in the back wants to talk. I'm, I'm worried. It's just, just the, yeah. <laughs> but I have no problem. Maybe the truth is back there. We need. I have you know. no problem incarcerating murderers, armed robbers, sequential thieves. Keep doing it, you know. And I, and I feel well grounded. Stand up and say right, wrong. I look out for mothers, young children, and mothers of young right. children because it's right to me. Right, but that doesn't mean that it's fundamentally morally wrong. That's a conventionalist system, and it might even match up with your nature. Right? It might be that, look, think of it this way. What if moral prescriptions, and this is not me, this is uh, Stevenson, A.J. Ayer, a bunch of folks from the logical positivist group back in the early uh, part of the 20th century. What if moral proposition, propositions, and to use their phraseology, which I love this phraseology, are just ejaculations of emotion? Right? And so when you say, uh, don't eat babies, it's morally wrong. All you're doing is expressing how you feel about the eating, the eating of babies. 
When you say murder is morally wrong, you're express, expressing your feeling about murder. You don't like it. Now, it's possible that somebody feels good about it. And so they would ejaculate in a different, a different emotion. So what we do a lot of times is we construct moral systems that parallel the way we feel. And so this is why human nature always comes into the discussion and so forth. Uh, but uh, it's still not fundamentally morally right or morally wrong. You're just expressing how you feel. And if we evolve a different nature, right? Let's say evolution crafts us to have a very different nature. Then our emotions would be very different. We'd have a different, different set of moral beliefs, none of which are true or false fundamentally. Uh, they're simply whatever they are that line up with this. But it's not based on biology. It's not, we just happen to feel that way because of the haphazards of evolution. It's not based, it's not based on anything. That's assuming that there is something that's true or false. It wouldn't make any sense to call it true or false. Go ahead. Okay, now you talk about moral truth, uh, you talk about moral truth, moral falseness, right. facts, and then feelings. Right. And of course, there's also that whole level of values in there. Well, when I think of something being moral, I don't think in terms of those words, truth and facts. Right. Uh, I feel like you're looking for something that's kind of harder and firmer well, what, than the give way I think Give me the I terminology which seems appropriate there then. What would be a Values. Better? Values? Yes. Values are normative. That's a normative word too. Normative means action guiding, right? And so you're just replacing normative when you say morality, that's a normative discipline. Value is a norm normative discipline. And so we need some way of defining what the norm is. And so just because you, the word value seems uh, less cold and, and defined, still doesn't, it doesn't help us. It makes it more amorphous. Well, I, I think mean, how, what are values? How do you find value, truth and value? If you have the value of uh, honor, well, okay, why do we value it? What gives it value? What, what imparts value to it? Well, I think that if you use that term, and I think that there may be a difference in the way, say, philosophers use the terms and the way we use them in ordinary conversation. And of Certainly course, I'm, case, yeah. I'm ordinary, so you know, I use yeah. it in a, in a different sense. But it seems like if you use that word value, you're looking at something somewhat softer than that idea of facts and truths and values allow you to bring in uh, what your society believes, what you believe, what... Um, profits us as evolutionary biological creatures. Right, which is teleological, by the way. Right, right. When you but say profits us in other words, it's, it's indirect. do we need to re yeah. totally reject the teleological argument? What is the well, purpose I, you don't need of to reject rejecting it? It's useful. It. Like, like I started with the scientific examples. It really is easier if you're teaching biology to talk about the purpose of the heart, right? And so the language itself is not dangerous. It's the ideology that's behind it. Right? I mean, if, if you think religion is trouble, and it is, right? this is a way of looking at the universe that just doesn't seem to ha have a good basis fundamentally for, for a lot of smart folks. Right? Now, we can sit here and have the arguments in the philosophy of religion all day, but I'm just saying most smart folks have said not a good way of looking at reality. And so anything that uh, smells of that model could also be trouble too, I suspect. We'll have to look at it and see one by one, and uh, in my view, when folks use teleological language, secular people that are trying to be very careful about what they mean about the world and their commitments and so, so forth in terms about how they behave, uh, then it's important that we uh, be consistent. And if there are no fundamental truths of morality, if there is no telos in the world, then we should construct moral beliefs that focus around that. And so when somebody gives me an argument that homosexuality is morally acceptable because we are biologically predisposed for sexual orientation, they owe me a lot of, their, a lot of other data there. They have to show me how the biological facts determine what is right or wrong, and that there are facts about what's right or wrong fundamentally. And so we can talk about, I understand your, your use of, I mean, uh, you know, there's been a lot of work in feminist ethics, for instance, right? The idea that uh, different sexes view moral obligations in very different ways and would use different uh, moral phraseology. For instance, Kant, a man from Germany, when he talks about morality, it's very rigorous and systematic and logically rule-governed, right? But uh, Elizabeth Anscombe, well, she talks about ethics. She talks about it in terms of moral virtues that are instilled through childhood and conditioning and so forth, right? And so there are different ways you can look at how one might arrive at morality and so on. But those are not the meta-ethical questions. Those are the normative ethical questions. Most of the times when we're talking about morality, you're making normative decisions. Is it right or wrong? Well, it's wrong because it doesn't benefit society. It's, it's wrong because it doesn't fit my nature. Those are normative decisions. Those are not meta-ethical decisions. So most of what we do in everyday life is checking to see with the moral proposition that we're dealing with at a given time matches to an overall moral proposition that we really like. 
the utilitarian maxim is really popular, right? Do that which produces the great amount of, greatest amount of happiness for the greatest number of people. So when you're checking to see whether you're a good person, you're checking to see if the moral principle that you've engaged in matches with that overarching principle. As a philosopher, that's a neat game. It's not easy to construct a, construct a normative system that works, but my biggest concern is, okay, nice overall principle, what backs it up? Now, religious folks like to say, well, God backs it up. That's not satisfactory. It just doesn't make, make it any better. So uh, neither does biology. Neither does fake teleology. It, j it just doesn't make it any better, ultimately, because it doesn't tell us about what's true or false. Go ahead. Well, I'm coming from a sociological perspective. That's what I do. Um, and I don't think that there is like a moral truth, per se. There are no moral, like absolute truths at all. But they're like socially constructed. Because if you go from like various cultures, completely different morally. Yeah. Like, uh, like when you talk about like various cultures that do like, I, I hate to say mutilation because that's not cross-cultural. It's not appropriate. But where we disagree with like gender mutilation or changes, while other cultures do, like that's a moral difference that's constructed like socially. It's not a truth, false. It's nothing. It's decided on by culture. So really, I feel like morals come from our social awareness and less from any kind of spiritual background or anything like that. There's no absolute moral truth. We could go, I mean, it could be like, if we were brought into a society where murder was important for the evolution of society or for the survival of our people, then it might be morally okay to kill somebody. It just depends well, on the but culture. But that's teleological. That you get, some of you guys are still missing my point when you say that if it helps us survive, that makes it okay. Survivability is not guaranteed as an overarching value of focus and purpose. I mean, the goal is not for us to survive. There ain't no goal. That, that's the whole point. I mean, awesome, you believe that, but you're, the burden of proof you is on you because I'm the one that's not making the claim, very, right? So. very first thing you said right. when you started off here is there is no such thing as teleology in the world. Oh, I don't know. There could be, but I don't have any evidence. No, I'm not, I can't, I can't say. And that's why we can't use teleological arguments. Without evidence. I'm without saying evidence. that there absolutely without any is evidence. Teleology, teleology in the world, that organisms are one thing that demonstrate this. We have actual purposes in the world. An electron doesn't, but we do. We really have goals, and I, as a mathematician, can describe systems that have this kind of behavior, that have teleological behavior, and just differentiate between them and things that don't. I can point very clearly to an electron and say, this has no teleology in it. There is not a purpose for electrons. They don't have some goal-directed behavior. On the other hand, human beings most certainly do. And it doesn't have to be some grand metaphysical purpose. I don't have any such thing, but I have personal purposes. Teleology right. really does exist, and it is a legitimate thing to use in an argument for morality. OK. Are we, so, so look, let me, I mean, we've already kind of had this same discussion in a little different context. Um, Goal-directed behavior is interesting. I'm not going to say it's not. I mean, I think my cat sometimes wants something to eat because it meows at me, right? And I think that sometimes uh, birds want to get to the south because it's going to get cold, right? But they don't. They don't really want that, right? No, I mean, they, they, they're, it's not goal-directed in the sense that there's some overarching model that guides their behavior. Right. right. No, I, no, I know. I, I know. I'm just making sure that we're clear on the way we're using directed, directed, uh, goal-directed behavior. No, I, I can make a hammer have meaning. I can make this water bottle have meaning, right? I mean, I can say it's for the purpose of holding water. I've imparted the meaning to it. This is where you're going to find meaning as a secular person. You have to create the meaning. But, but look, this, this idea that somehow, somehow sophisticated systems get teleology as they accumulate matter, right? I mean, your argument is, well, electron here, it doesn't have any meaning, right? Well, let's hook another uh, piece of matter to that, and let's hook another one to it, and let's hook another one to it, and let's get it functioning in a really complicated way where it does stuff, and then all of a sudden, it's got teleology. Now, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. That's all I am, is I'm a bunch of matter. 
And so I want to know where that magical moment, I mean, if that, this is how crazy this argument gets. Wait, there's no teleology at one. Is there at two? Is there at three? What's the threshold? And then I can make something have purpose by taking matter away from it and adding to it. Oh, it's got teleology. Oh, no, it doesn't. It has teleology. No, it doesn't. What a crazy view of the universe. Now, maybe it is that way, but I'm not going to buy it until we have evidence that you can, by making something more complex and sophisticated, make it have telos. Now, I can make telos by having a thought about it, right? I can say that thing has purpose because I'm thinking about it having purpose, but does it have metaphysical teleology? Is it built into the structure of reality like the religious believer believes? No, it just doesn't seem to. Well, the only system that humankind did not create is the ecosystem. Humankind created religion and created politics. They're one and the same, okay? We, mankind, humankind created these ideologies for good and for ill, a lot of times for ill, but mostly as part of structure and order and not chaos. And so we, human beings, thinking individuals, we created and invented morality out of whole cloth. The motivation may be different. The motivation might be for one's self-interest, for one's sense of empathy or sympathy for others, but we invented it for good or ill, and the justifications are going to vary behind what these moral concepts are. But going back on her point, to a degree it is cultural. Yeah. Again, that's all invented. That's all human construct. Right. And as Absolutely. time has, has gone Probably by, agree. we're evolving, but not only evolving in a biological sense, but we're also evolving in a intellectual sense, in a technological sense. We, right. have, we have policies today that we consider enlightened. We look back 100 years, 200 years, well, what were those people thinking? They, were, they, they had their own thoughts. They had achieved or reached a certain level of thinking. We're evolving in our thinking. Right. And, and that's an yeah. ongoing process. So it's not that morality is this, is this tangible, palpable, measurable thing as it is what we constructed. We invented it. We invented God for a number of reasons. To explain tornadoes and, and typhoons, to get control over that tribe over there because my tribe's better than your tribe. And that's... All human construct. Right. I think. I mean. I, I agree. I mean. Look. I, I'm not saying that we don't. The, the moral nihilist, right? And this is the, the the position I've been advocating sort of indirectly. The moral nihilist ends up in the same place as the ethical relativist, right? The ethical relativist says society has made up the moral code. The, the moral nihilist will say, yeah, we make up some rules to follow around that help us get into a better arrangements with the future and so on, fit our nature better and so forth. But the difference between the moral nihilist, nihilist and the ethical relativist is that one is a cognitive claim and one's not. The ethical relativist claims that there are truths about morality. They don't, they don't disavow uh, the fact that there's not a moral substructure or that there is a moral substructure. The uh, moral nihilist says, we've just made some rules up that are neither true nor false, and we follow them. But I think that uh, it's, it's, it's probably a deeper issue than just the sociology that is at, uh, at the root of creating these teleological systems like religion and uh, various forms of ethical judgments. I think that there's uh, a biological drive. I think uh, that there's some pretty good experiments in psychology from, you guys familiar with magical thinking? Uh, that, that suggests, I mean, that, there's actually a branch of that, that handles wor worrying about why we think magically, right? And so a good example is at Oxford, they took these little kids and they convinced them that they'd made a duplication machine. You guys have probably seen this experiment, right? It was just an empty box that made some sounds and so on, but you could take like a baseball and put in it, push a button and make a bunch of sounds, and the baseball would pop out on the other side. And so it was a Star Trek-like technology where you could copy objects, right? And so you could stick virtually any artifact you wanted to in this machine, and the little kids would love them. It didn't matter. It still had the same properties. So they'd take the baseball. Uh, they'd take, uh, you know, um, any uh, bu building blocks, Legos, whatever you want to stick through there, they would take. But then they show up and say, remember, this is in England, right? And they say, this, this, uh, this spoon was owned by the Queen of England. Now, they love the Queen in, in England, right? We don't really care that much here. Uh, this would be like, uh, this was owned by Bob Dylan, right? And so, uh, in our culture... Uh, and so uh, they put the, queen, the, uh, the spoon in there. The queen really didn't own it, but they stuck it in there, pushed the button, and the children refused to accept it. Now, why did they refuse to accept it? Well, they said because that wasn't the one that was owned by the queen of England. So already at five years old, you believe that there are these magical properties that get transferred around the world, right? That you impart, like, you know, John Lennon's piano threw it all around the country, and people walk up to it and touch it. Right? What were they going to get from that? What magical thing was coming out of that piano? What... What special John Lennon substance? Uh, you know, Elvis Presley would throw his towels into the 
audience, right? I mean, it's just a towel. And, and so uh, we, we already believe that you run back into a burning house to get grandma's quilt. Right? Now, you're thinking magically. This is just a thing that's made of material, like we were discussing earlier. It's just made of matter. It doesn't have any magical properties. And so, now, what, what have sociobiologists argued caused us to think this way? Uh, they've argued that we think this way because it probably was an early theory of uh, early uh, manifest, manifestation of germ theory. Right? In other words, if you're sick and I touch you, and then I get sick later, you can figure out the causal relationship. I mean, um, our brains have been this way for 200,000 years. And so we've been able to figure out causal relations. And so we just weren't very good at science yet. So we really didn't understand there were pathogens that are transferring these things around. But they figured out that we could transfer properties from one thing to another. And so you can get religious artifacts the same way. Jesus touches it, and then the magic stays with it, right? Now, that already tells me that we see the world as having some deep substructure. Biology has perhaps endowed us with that sort of tool. Uh, right? You guys know about um, the God helmet and all that, right? And so we know there's a part of our brain that if you, if you stimulate it, which, by the way, Martin Luther, remember, uh, the Protestant reformer, nearly got struck by lightning. Right? And so he starts a whole new branch of Christianity after he gets his brain cooked with micro, uh, electromagnetic radiation, which is very suspicious, right? Uh, but uh, I already know that a part of my brain makes me think magically. And so we have to continuously work against this way of looking at the world. I think that we're probably, as a result of the haphazards of evolution, we have the tendency to see the universe in that way. Go ahead. I've listened to us talk a lot about morality and kind of talk all about it and the meaning and... I'm just kind of wondering, you know, how does it relate to the meaning of life? And if we have some opinions on that. Right. Uh, well, I mean, look, the, the idea is that um, we tend to look for meaning. Why are we here? What's the purpose? Is a question that you're trying to answer. You know, why bother? Right? You know the myth of Sisyphus, you push the rock up the hill, and then the damn thing rolls back down, and then you push it back up again. And, Right, and so, you know, Camus, you guys remember this, right? And so, uh, what's the point of that? You know, this is Camus' question about why, why do we even bother with life? And so his idea is you shake the fist at the world and you keep pushing the rock up the hill even though you know it's going to roll back down. Right, and so we look for the reason why we're here. What's the purpose? And one way you, people often try to manifest that is in terms of moral obligations. Right, that we have a purpose here, and that's to be moral, to behave a certain way to better others' lives, and that's usually couched in a moral framework, right? Or, yeah. that, that none of us really think that we have an inherent purpose. Right. Purpose is what we create. But my point is, is that you still do kind of, you still do kind of, I don't know you individually, but I'm just saying, oftentimes secular people still do kind of have that view because of the way that teleology sneaks in. Secular people make those biological arguments all the time for sexual orientation, which link to moral judgments about that kind of behavior. That is a belief that somehow you can find meaning and purpose in terms of our moral behavior through the truths of biology. Now, maybe that's true, but I don't see those bridge arguments yet, and if you give them to me, I will publish them and teach at Yale next year, because folks are looking for that, I promise. They're just not there. And so uh, what, what I'm saying is, is that why this is relevant to the meaning of life is because if you can determine the nature of morality, then maybe you can find it. You know, remember, Aquinas argued that uh, we have purpose in life because God is ingrained in the mind of every single person, the principles, principles of morality, and your purpose for being here is to use your rational faculties to find those right moral truths. And some people just don't use reason correctly, and that's why they're bad. Right? And so that tells me that it's easy to make the link to morality uh, for, in terms of our purpose and, and reason for existence. So many of you have abandoned that. I understand. You found your way through reason and logic to abandon that. But you still have vestiges of these pseudo-teleological systems. It's just been replaced with science. And so I love science, but I don't want it to become the new religious justification. You have to be very, very suspicious of attempts uh, to justify our fundamental beliefs that look just like uh, the religious model. There's no reason to assume or believe that there is such a thing as a meaning of life to begin with. It's a, moot, it's a moot point, yeah. because it's, again, a human invention. Yeah. Some futurists predict that given the speed of technology, everyone here is probably familiar with Moore's Law and the new singularity, Ray Kurzweiler, by the year 2045, we'll have the human brain reverse engineered. We'll ascribe the meaning to it. We I've been, I've been hearing that for 20 years, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, but see, people, uh, people yeah. ascribe their own meaning anyway. <laughs> I think they will eventually, but I, I don't think there's anything magical in here. But No, there's uh, nothing magical about yeah. it. What, what, I'm, what I'm saying is, yeah. is, based on what Ann was saying, is 
there's no reason to believe that there is such a thing as a meaning to life, and why bother? You're born, you live, you die. End of argument. Some of us die better than others, some of us live better than others, and maybe what we've done culturally, sociologically, empathetically, however way you want to put it, is we've decided that we're going to come up with rules and systems and policies, some of them are for the good, some of them for the not so good, to try and better life while we are here. Right, whatever better means. Right, and uh, I, uh, I like you. I like you a lot because everything, every, everything you said, yeah, yeah, everything you said uh, lines up fairly well with what I'm arguing here. And I mean, I'm, I'm arguing this in a more amorphous way, but uh, that's a good way of condensing it. Uh, the problem is, is that we like meaning, right? And so uh, that makes us make mistakes about whether meaning is really there. Psychologically, we think magically, we like the world to have meaning, we like it to have purpose, and so even the smart uh, secular person has to be very careful about where they are imparting meaning to things in the world. They have to be very vigilant to be aware of the fact that they will do that in places uh, that it's not appropriate. Now, maybe there is true fundamental meaning. I'm not going to say that it can't be there, uh, but I still have to see those arguments that would lead us to it, uh, ultimately. And so, yeah, uh, so the question is, and then maybe this is the job for psychology and sociology now, right? How do, you, uh, how do you raise children in a way where they are genuine free thinkers and, and can be aware of the fact that they uh, are uh, searching for meanings as a result of biology and conditioning, maybe, and so on, that aren't going to probably be there? Right. Can you do that in a way where society doesn't self-destruct? Because, I mean, the first thing I hear from my students when I talk about that the aliens are never going to come save us, because this is the new pseudo-religion, right? The aliens will be back and they'll fix us and so on, right? And uh, that uh, Jesus is not going to be back, or what, whatever their favorite, pro favorite prophet is, and they say, well, what's the point? As if they're just going to commit mass suicide, you know, the next hour they find that out. And so that tells me that if there isn't some deep structure, they start to feel like the universe unravels. Now, of course, the minute they walk out of the classroom and get back caught up in their daily affairs, that goes away, right? Because what gives us meaning actually, uh, and, and this is Nagel that's made this argument, not me, I can't take credit for it, is that we just have our nose to the grindstone so much, we just make up meaning in daily life and don't think about it much. I mean, my purpose right now is to give you a talk about meaning. Now, later on, my purpose is going to be to have something to eat, and I'm going to have a purpose later on of going on a bike ride, right? And so uh, I have those little purposes. Now, the smart person steps back and goes, man, that's just a bunch of made-up shit, right? And so when you do that, uh, you start to get worried because the religious believer, you know, in some respects, if they're dumb enough about it, has refuge psychologically, Right? They, have a way of, they have a way of finding meaning, and they feel better about it. Now, I, you know, we made the decision a long time ago to take our heads out of the sand, and once it's out, you can't put it back in, right? I mean, I have a, I have a student, for instance, that's going through this right now, and, uh, you know, some people maybe uh, uh, need to keep their heads in the sand. Maybe they're not ready for it psychologically. They have to be right at the right place at the right time intellectually and psychologically because it can be very destructive for some folks. But if you made the decision, and a lot of you have done this a long time ago, before I even did it, and you know that meaning is not out there and you have to make it up every day, maybe that's liberating, but it's also scary too. Uh, there's a psychological component that's not, not particularly satisfying. Since you're student to us, because we have a recovery program. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that uh, your comment, one of your comments got me thinking about stereotypes and how a lot of times when we talk about those in an academic sense, we talk about how you know, we all feel like we don't use them, but we do. And if you take, I think there's somewhere online you can actually go take a test and it will show you based on your questions that you in fact do still use some because that's the way our brain works. We have to structure things and categorize things. Stereotyping or, saves time. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's our framework. Yeah. And I kind of wonder if maybe we do do this a little bit and you just don't notice because it's the way we think, it's a construct we need and it's kind of like, you know, when you get used to driving, you don't really, like, you can auto drive somewhere. And yeah, you can like, tell. Yeah, here? and that, that's well studied. I think we kind of think way. like that sometimes. Yeah. So I don't know, maybe I do do this sometimes. Right. And so I don't think you'll ever be able to escape it because when we're really doing something that we're into, it has purpose, or you wouldn't be really into it. Right. And so it, it, uh, I think the reasonable position for the rational person to take is to step back and be capable of realizing it's not really for any purpose, but not losing psychological touch with 
what's necessary for survival and happiness and so on. And that's a fine line. All, many of you have already been through this. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You vacillate in between meaningless and meaningfulness. Right? And so, uh, you know, sometimes I don't blame the religious believer. I think that they're irrational and they don't have good evidence, but I understand sometimes the psychological motivation. You know, not the crazy religious folks, right, that are blowing themselves up and, you know, going into abortion clinics and shooting people. But the people that are looking for psychological comfort here, right? I mean, uh, maybe it is a, a psychological model that works better for us as a species. I don't know. I think it tends to interfere with science and truth. But those of us that are secular, we've made the choice to try to understand how the world actually is, and I think that's, that's just the result of it. You're always gonna be in and out of meaning. Uh, so, th you know, this is not philosophy, the, the job of philosophy now, right? Now psychology, uh, sociology, uh, have to come in and say, here's how we could produce citizens that could be happy and be secular, because that's never been done, right? I mean, no one, did that, who, whose job is that? To raise children in a way, I mean, I've tried to do that with my son, it doesn't work. Uh, it just doesn't work. I mean, by the time they get sophisticated enough to actually be free thinkers, what you've accidentally done is ingrained all kinds of meaning and purpose in their mind because you had to do that because they were such simple systems for the first 15 years of their life. And so how do you actually train a child to be a genuine free thinker and not struggle with meaning and purpose that ends in a drug addiction, suicide, or whatever else later in life. It's a very difficult thing to do. Most of us have done it haphazardly, right? We've just found our way through it. We're not dead now. We figured out how to deal with it. And maybe you still do deal with it with alcohol and drugs or whatever, right? As long as it's in moderation, as Aristotle said. Uh, but yeah, I'm good. I'm disappointed that you haven't said anything yet. She said I had to look out for you, and you haven't said a damn thing to me. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the it's all, argument. It's all <laughs> so, the, the argument that when you start with electrons, protons, neutrons, and there's no meaning or anything like that, and you start building things up, eventually you get to the complexity where somebody strung copper wire and Samuel Morse invented a code, and the next thing you know, meaning is being transmitted across these wires from mind to mind. At some level of complexity, you have to grant that there are possible newer things, you know, I mean, we, you know, ideas, words, pictures. Uh, above your head, there's a sky and a blue sky, and we may take, talk about that's wavelength and so forth, and our eyes adjusted to it and we interpret it. But eventually, somebody does a painting where he has... Uh, a meaning that he's imparting to you yes. at a, at a certain word. level That's of complexity you have to agree that there may be totally new values you know expressed well, just where, because it's tricky. electrons I mean, I'm, I'm very sympathetic right I, I understand mm -hmm. that as the system gets more sophisticated the likelihood of it being capable of imparting meaning to some system makes right. perfect sense right and I can um, say that morally it's morally wrong to lead children astray although other people they they lead them astray thinking they're doing right you have to think about what this implies though. this yeah. is tricky stuff in the future by the way right because what you're talking about is what philosophers call intentionality and it's spelled with an s right and so um, my mind can be about that water bottle. And when I say mind, I mean brain. I'm just using that term really loosely, right? And so I, I have my, my brain or my mind has aboutness of the water bottle. That's what intentionality is. Now, it doesn't make much sense to say this water bottle can be about this thing here, whatever it is, a transformer, I don't know, right? And so that doesn't make much sense. And so what's, what, something weird happens as you make things more complex, all of a sudden they're capable of having aboutness. Now, that's a tricky thing. And that's where I think that uh, teleology comes from. As you move up the hierarchy of structure, those things become sophisticated enough to impart meaning. Now, this is going to be an issue for us technologically, technologically eventually, right? Because if I build a supercomputer that has the same algorithms as my brain does, well, you're talking about this 45 years or whatever, right? Then is that, and maybe this is already happening now, is that supercomputer going to have the capability of being about other things, right? Or is it already happening? Is that thermostat back there does it already exhibit attention, intentionality? Because it does a really good job of keeping the temperature exactly the same, it's right? Still in the right, and so yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that's a whole other philosophical problem, right? Because if that's the case, this is all just a fun game that we're playing in the matrix. 
uh, could still confound the truth. But so uh, I think that uh, this is where philosophy of mind links in here, right? This is what I'm dealing with is intentionality and way mental states work. And so as we move up the hierarchy, yes, but there's no real meaning. There's no uh, meaning in the deep metaphysical sense that the religious believer has subscribed to. It's imparted by the complexity of the system. And so hopefully the system is, is complex enough to be able to look back at its own function and realize that the meaning is just made up. That's what we're doing right now. I'm trying to convince you that we should do necessarily. So I saw. We're change the meaning as we go. Because yeah. what has happened since whatever we walked out of Mesopotamia and library is with more and more science and technological developments, we're now controlling our evolution. We're controlling how we're going to evolve, not nature. And that's, well, that's I think, where, where this is going. The rest of this all becomes moot because once we are in full control of our evolution, Nature, forget it. Well, we'll if you mean like genetic it. engineering, I totally agree, right? But I mean, that it's just means genetic oh, engineering. That... It's what we're talking about reverse engineering in the human brain, having nanobots that go through your bloodstream that eat up the plaque. It's entirely possible that the human lifespan could reach 150. Yeah, but evolution is still going to occur. No matter what technological tricks we come up with making ourselves live longer, evolution still occurs. It's just going to be in a different way. I totally but, agree. But, but we, we could, with technology of genetic engineering, uh, we can go in there and craft it the way we want to. The, the, the difficulty with that is it's going to be, it'll break down based on socioeconomic class. Uh, rich folks will have genetically engineered kids and uh, we won't. And so you're going to, you think that there are disparities in our society now? You wait. Yeah, you wait. Um, 100 years from now, way worse. Because you're going to have superhumans, you know, Nietzsche and Superman uh, that can run 30 miles per hour, never gets cancer. Uh, brain functions really well. I don't think there's any reason to think that it would go any other way, ultimately, unless somehow we become more self-aware and concerned with our fellow person. I just don't see it. So. If survival is the role, I think that you have a problem because there are a lot of societies that are built on religion that have thousands of years of perfectly good survival. Yeah. So you have to, first of all, decide what, you know, what is the goal. And then also, my understanding is science is not fact. It's a process of learning yeah. that where you don't really have the, the fact. The technique more right, than anything right. else. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I agree. Uh, I, I'm not subscribing to the view that science gives us truth either, right? Uh, I'm simply saying that if you look at the available theoretical models uh, for understanding the truth, science by far has been the most successful. Religion has been a decent model too. Uh, you know, I, I would argue that Christianity probably pay, played a significant role, and Nietzsche has made this argument too, that uh, it tempered the, the behavior of folks in the Middle Ages in Europe. I mean, we were some pretty nasty people in the Middle Ages, and so people started to feel guilty and have a conscience and so on. But, it, you know, as Nietzsche said, God is dead, so it's run its course. Uh, we have a new model, which is scientific. Uh, the problem is, is that it ends up being kind of a vacuous model in terms of the emotional, psychological components that religion had. And I think that's what a lot of secular people struggle with. This is what I was talking about uh, with, uh, with you back there. I mean, it, it, we, don't, we vacillate between meaningless and meaningfulness, ultimately. So. And the science is changing as well, based on, on what she just said. Now we figured out, wait a minute, there's this thing called dark matter. And now we're scratching the surface of, of quantum physics. I mean... We're talking about science that we haven't discovered yet, we haven't figured out yet, and we're just scratching the surface. And, but and the, when we do, that's going to change but I think, all but the But see, I, I see a glimmer in people's eyes when they talk about this stuff as if we're going to find some meaning in all that. And so uh, you have to be very careful, right? Because science can become uh, the new religion for a lot of, a lot of folks. It is. I, I, I think that science, I think we have to be honest here. I think an instrumentalist view in science is probably the most reasonable. Uh, I think that when science comes and tells, tells us the universe is this way, well, that's a descriptive instrument that we can use to produce technology and survive and so on. Uh, the, the, but does it accurately explain the universe on a fundamental level? The mathematically based sciences, I think the math probably does, just given the way uh, the universe works from a logical viewpoint, but is the description of what a quark is ever going to be accurate of what a quark really is? Well, we don't know until uh, we I, get there. It's, well, I, I just think it's a tool at that point, right? Because, uh, I mean, a lot of those things don't even really make sense other than in a mathematical way. And so I think mathematics probably gives us a clear way of peering into the fundamental nature of reality. Uh, but it's not a psychologically satisfying way, and so you want to, you want to. Well, for you it is if you're if you're a professional mathematician, obviously, right? But for the rest of us that want somebody to draw a picture of what the hell a quark is, 
right. right? Well, I mean, you know, at first it's what's this thing? No, wait, wait, but it's, it's, it's blurred out. Now, wait, wait, and, and so you start to become unsatisfied psychologically. So I'm not making, look, I, I'm a nihilist across the spectrum here personally. I, I don't see any moral facts, and I don't think science is giving us the fundamental truth of reality either. It's just a much better system than that one. Well, but right. science is also yeah. evolving because of technology. We didn't know what a quark was. They thought a quark was something else. But it's still an instrument. No matter how much yeah. knowledge we get about uh, how the world works from the scientific view, mm -hmm. science will still just be an instrument for looking at how the universe works. And so we won't find meaning there either. I mean, we have to be very careful. We're going to keep looking for meaning and trying to uncover it. I just think we have to, to own up that we are responsible, right? We are fundamentally responsible, assuming that we're free agents. And I don't want to have the free will discussion, please. Right? Uh, assuming that we're free agents in some meaningful sense, that uh, uh, we can impart meaning when we need to and be responsible for it. Now, that's a scary thing. And so my question is, how do you craft a society into that without mass chaos and uh, drug addiction and whatever else would be a result? So. Uh, you, one of the things that science has done is rejected an awful lot of what used to pass for morality. Modern societies have evolved standards of justice that didn't used to exist at all. People used to believe in superstitious yeah. crap. Ra racism would be a good example of and so on. Yeah. The reasons that they give now for saying that, no, you shouldn't persecute someone who's homosexual, because not because you have some, as you seem to think we have to have, some reason that justifies biologically what it is, but because they're people and they are subject to the same standards of justice as any other people. This has become much more universal. It used to be that the only people who were subject to certain kinds of morality, the only people who were uh, capable of being murdered, were the people who were high level aristocrats in some society and everybody else was a non-person. Women were non-people. A good share of the society were non-people. We have through our, not only science, but a lot of other stuff too, but particularly due to science, we have raised the standards of all this. And the, the definition of what now constitutes wrongful death is much more justified from a standpoint of justice, from rational arguments that we have. And I think, yes, this does give us a way of using science to improve morality. This is what we've done particularly in the last 300 years. We no longer have slavery. We no longer have subjugation of women. We no longer have. <laughs> well, and, and you, you, I know you read. Less, we have it less. And we don't have subjugation of women the way that it was even 100 years ago. We don't have slavery in the modern world. There is yes, no... We do have <laughs> every, every country in the world has banned slavery. If you're it doesn't mean it doesn't exist, though, Tom. It, it, means that, it means that it's really minor compared to what it was even 100 years ago. It means that it's not trivial. I mean, obviously, cases of this exist, but it's almost non-existent compared to what it used to be. It used to be well, let's, let's, but let's focus back on what the real, the real philosophical problem is here, right? I mean, but, how does society, how does society get credit for getting rid of slavery? I mean, uh, science, have, science does not have credit for it. No, that's not true. The, there have been people. What is his name? Tom? Is it Tom? Tom. There have there have been people against slavery long before we had any formalized sense of science. Well, but look, let me just let me make a comment back. With, with, we, we, Tom, Tom and I. The first the first people who ever opposed slavery and advocated abolition were 18th century French. Okay, so let's let's just focus on the back on the the, 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 the issue of meaning, right? I mean, look, you, you, this, you have made the same argument three different ways. I understand your position, right? And, and so, um, once again, this belief that somehow science has shown us what is, it can show us maybe what's better, right, in terms of what produces more happiness for us, given our, right, but, but well, what's rational and better aren't necessarily the same thing, right? And, and so, um, no, I mean... Um, I, I, I was about to go to a really weird example, but I won't go there. 
Look, I understand, but just because science has shown us that, uh, that there's no justification for uh, racial discrimination or for uh, sexual orientation discrimination and so on, it doesn't tell us whether or not we should change our moral beliefs about that. It just does not follow. It, 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 it describes to me what my genome might be in terms of my sexual orientation. It can predict my behavior using uh, certain claims about biology, but it can tell me whether my behavior is right or wrong. It is still possible, even if, one, just give you a simple example, it's possible even if our orientation for sex is based on genetics that it can still be morally wrong to be gay. I can imagine that world. I don't believe that's the case because I personally don't subscribe to anything being morally wrong or morally right at all. There aren't any moral facts, but it's possible that the science can tell you one thing and that the moral code could fundamentally, fundamentally be something very different metaethically. They don't have to line up. That's my whole point. And so unless you have a way of showing whether they line up or not, you cannot base your moral beliefs on science. And so we have, I, I understand you, you shake your head and say yes, but you still have not given me that bridge argument, and that's the one I need to go to Yale, and I really want to go to <laughs> Yale. Right? I mean, I'm interested in what you have to say, but you always stop short of giving me the satisfaction that I need to make that bridge to, you're tr look, you're trying to make the case, read G.E. Moore, okay? He's the one who, who cooked this stuff up first. You are trying to show me how to go from factual claims to value claims. Science deals with facts. Ethics deals with values, right? I can say, Bob likes to steal. How, how do I know that? That's a factual claim. Bob, you like to steal? I love it. Love it. Stealing makes Bob feel good. I can interview him again. You like, does it make you feel good? Let me test and see if your pleasure center is kicking off in your brain when you're stealing. Yes, it is. But those are both factual claims. But if I say, therefore, Bob ought to steal, doesn't work because I went from a factual claim to a value claim. Now, can I do it if I stick in another value claim? Sure. Uh, you ought to do what makes you feel good. And ought is a value claim. So I can go fact, fact, value to value, but I can never go fact, fact to value. And science will always deal with fact. That's what it does. Now, I'm not saying it's genuine fact. It's, um, it's maybe instrumental fact. I don't want to say science is the absolute truth. But to somehow make a, a moral claim from a scientific claim, I want to know that hat trick. I really do. Because uh, Plasky Tech doesn't pay me a lot. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> What I see so far is that we always seem to, no matter where you are, what you think, if you're looking at facts, you are always looking for a purpose. Yes. Is there another uh, way of thinking? Well, I mean, I, man, if you, <laughs> I wish, <laughs> right? I mean, like I suggested, this is just Thomas Nagel. I think that the only way that as a uh, secular, rational person uh, uh, you can approach this is to be aware of the fact that there are no fundamental meanings or that we haven't discovered any yet, at least, right, just to be safe epistemically, and then uh, realize that you have to make up your own meanings. And so um, a way to avoid that psychologically is just stay busy. I mean, this doesn't become a problem. And I mean, you know, when we were groveling around the dirt trying to find something to eat, nobody worried about where meanings came from. But the minute in ancient Greece we had enough time, all of a sudden, uh, Plato's like, oh, wait, you know, how do things get their meaning? Socrates, uh, you know, you know the, the early folks, right? And so uh, the minute that we uh, don't have something to do, if we're smart enough and introspective enough, we realize that there's really no meaning to all of this. And so you're looking for, is there something to replace it? That's what I'm saying. You cannot replace it with science. You cannot replace it with these secular ways of looking. It's just a, another, it's a pseudo-teleological belief. I don't want to say pseudo-religious because it really doesn't have the, you know, the structure of religion and sort of the, uh, uh, the ritual and so on. But it's still, uh, maybe there are scientific rituals, I don't know. Uh, but it seems to be a pseudo... See, see, yeah. Well, but you, I think anybody that knows anything about science knows there's not a method, right? I mean, just it's not an algorithm. If that were the case, then uh, we would just step one, step two, and we'd solve all our scientific problems, right? And just it's a lot of luck involved. I have this concept called fairness, and we're far beyond it. But you brought up Nietzsche, and you know his famous quote, "God is dead." And I want to remind you that Nietzsche at that time was referring to the fact that the churches were empty. They built all these huge cathedrals. They were empty because the Spirit of God was gone from the German people. He wasn't declaring that God was dead. Well, he's not he saying physically. He never thought spirit. he existed physically. No, no. He meant yeah, that the religion, religion in the was... The human people in yeah. Germany yeah. was all gone considering their huge monuments to God. And yeah, that's I mean, what he meant, not the fact well, that I mean, God had died uh, and, and had a body somewhere decomposing. I'm not, a, I'm not a Nietzschean scholar, but I have read Beyond and Evil and uh, several of the other fundamental works. 
And sort of the, the traditional way that philosophers want to view Nietzsche's claim there is that um, what he's saying is that the concept of religion played a useful role at a given time in our, in our, for our species, but that we don't need God anymore. You can, be, you can be replaced with some other, and he wanted to replace it with this concept of a superman and a slave morality, master morality uh, model, and so on. Uh, I mean, we can argue about that all day, uh, but I, I agree with him in the sense that religion uh, is something that's a vestige of the past. It's not a useful tool anymore, except for maybe psychologically. And so that's, that's the rub here. How does the secular person balance their way of looking at the world that has nothing to do with religion with a recognition that there may be some useful psychological components? Go ahead. Well, One, I guess I just read a study that showed that atheists are the most mistrusted and most stigmatized minority group in the United States. Right. And the reason why is because we don't have a doctrine of morality, that we basically have no morals, that... It's just a misconception it, is what it is. Of course, yeah. but with this kind of argument, where are we going with morals Oh, it's not gonna here? help. Like, well, it, I'm, yeah, I'm that's just, what I'm <laughs> kind of getting at is, this is like not helping our pers like society's perspective on us if we become completely immoral nihilist like we well that's that's if, like, why we still have our yeah. morals but we have no explanation for our morals well anymore. it's even worse you would, would or you we have up, no morals at well, all let's say you subscribe to a motivism and you say uh well my my moral code is just a re result of my emotional states right now anybody knows pretty quickly that's kind of a dangerous way of looking at morality now we do tend to have very similar sentiments and so we all usually will feel bad if somebody's being murdered but not all of us you know Dahmer didn't and charlie manson right uh, and so uh, if you're asking me as a philosopher, what do we do about it? Uh, I'm a philosopher. I just try to figure out how I think the best way I can, the way the universe puzzles together. Uh, that would be the job of psychology and sociology to try, yes, to try to, to figure out how to raise children. Well, how do you raise children in a way that they are secular and informed and free thinkers and also realize that there's no deep substructure to reality? Right, that's a difficult, difficult thing to do. So, part yeah. of this yeah. goes upon what yeah. you're talking about is the narrative that we've been taught. We've all been taught a narrative, you know, and as you said, sociologic, different countries, different cultures, different narratives. But the use of the terms that we're using here is part of this problem. We're using terms that come from religion. We're using terms like moral, immoral, good, evil, bad, wrong. What happens if we change the terminology to say? What we define or what we're calling moral or good today would be something along the lines of what benefits the well-being yeah, of mean. the individual as opposed to that behavior that is to the detriment of the individual. We're still using terms that are religious terms. When we say good and evil, moral and immoral, what if we do away with those words and come up with different terms? What's in her well-being, not just best interest, but what's going to benefit her well-being as opposed to policies, practices, or whatever, well, I mean, that's going to be contrary. Honestly, let's say I put on the psychologist's hat here, right, and, and try to play that game, looking at it from a philosopher's viewpoint, I, I think the real trick would not be just to, turn, to change the terminology. The real trick would be, uh, I mean, really Aristotle had a lot of insight here. Aristotle, when you, when you read Aristotle's ethics, he never makes any moral prescriptions. And it's really frustrating from a contemporary Western point of view, because we want... We want some sort of deontological rule set or some uh, overarching principle to follow, like the utilitarian maxim, or don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. But Aristotle won't say any of that, right? And so, um, yeah, and so it's very, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's a very relativistic yet rationally based system, right? He thinks, and this is very similar to what Tom was, is what Tom, Tom was arguing, right? That, uh, that somehow through logic alone, we can discover what works best for us and what doesn't. Yes. Totally agree. Still doesn't mean it's true or false morally, ultimately, right? Uh, but I think that we have to look at it in terms of a virtue-based system. Because the problem with morality, by the way, I mean, even just go with the Judeo-Christian model or whatever. The problem is not what is the right thing to do and what should human rights be. We could all agree on 10 core moral principles in this room right now. We could haul in fundamentalist Christians from every ilk, and we could get them all to agree with those 10 core. And we might argue about gay marriage and all that sort of stuff. But the fundamental moral rules, we can all agree. And we can bring people from all over the world, and we could agree on those 10 core moral principles. The problem is, is how do you get people to behave that way? Right? It's not whether we can agree rationally what rules work best for us as a society. 
Right? This is beyond the philosophical problem. We're talking about the sociological problem. And so you've got to, this is where psychologists, this is their job, sociologists. How do you instill virtues? This is what they'd be called at this point because they would be behavioral dispositions. You teach a kid rules, he doesn't necessarily follow the rules, but you teach him how to behave on a fundamental level, he will. Think about your grandmother, your grandfather, if they're still alive, right? I can remember having a conversation with my uh, grandmother, and you know, I asked her one time, this is when I was in high school, why didn't you do X? It was some moral decision she made, right? And she was maybe in her 60s at the time. She said, well, it just wasn't right. She didn't give me some utilitarian model where she said, well, you know, it didn't maximize happiness for society, or she didn't give me some Kantian model which would be logically inconsistent if we follow that rule, right? She just said it wasn't right. She, it just did not seem right to her. And so what you need to have a moral society is to raise children in a way where they just feel like something is wrong and feel like something is right. Now, the key is instilling the correct virtues at the beginning. Right? I mean, this is kind of deceptive because you are conditioning people to behave a particular way. But we would have a much more successful society. Right? If they, if they, people on death row know what they should have done. They know all the rules. They but, just didn't but do it. But that's not really right? raising free-thinking children to do you, that. You can't. That's my argument with my son. I have, you just can't do that. I, my child has grown, and so it's... But I still, the phrase I'm using more often these days with my young nephews and, and things are um, what pursuits make you feel that life is, is, is worthwhile. And usually it's making someone else feel better. I mean, I have very, very young um, nephews in the phrase that I, and we have a lot of different ideologies. And so I don't want to push my ideology off on and cause a civil war in the family. So, so I ask what, instead of it being for the good of God or for the whatever, right. you know, is, is, you know, what makes it, you know, your existence feel worthwhile. And hurting someone, it rarely makes a person feel rarely. like they have done something rarely. worthwhile. <laughs> Yeah, right. If they stop and think about it. But that's a phrase that I have been using that, that seems to make the child think and is, as far as their behavior. And um, I mean, I'm saying like eight years old and up, it seems to me that they do stop and think about what they're doing. But I, I think there is a danger in this idea that somehow, I mean, look, even the studies on, I mean, go back to the magical thinking stuff. Uh, ki kids don't really start to understand um, complicated metaphysical... Let, let me just uh, interrupt you because okay. here's the problem I've got going on in my family right now is that I really do think I have probably four children that are probably atheists, but their parents aren't. And, and so I don't, I do not uh, criticize things so that like are going Christmas, on. So like you take them to the back room and say, They're hey, very uh, intelligent. Uh, and then, and then no, they're, they're very intelligent there. kids. <laughs> and so I don't, I discourage you know, what they're doing, and, 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 but and so that's the situation there is I do think because they are intelligent and they are really observing the world uh, and, and they at least are able to talk to me in a different way than they talk to some other people. Right. And, um, and, and so that's that situation. I think really children left to their own devices probably do figure it out, just like figuring out Santa. And... Um, and there are a group, and I have one that has come out that actually is, has something posted on his Facebook about the flying spaghetti monster and stuff. So he's 15 now. So he has, you know, come out. But I think my sister believes that's a phase he's going through. So I am right now, and I think because I have been able to um, not criticize their parents, but listen to their talk, you know, right. that things are going, I believe things are going really well. But... <laughs> But that's the situation going on in my own family right now. Right. And I think that children left to their own devices, that, that's what they do figure out, that, that this magic, magical entity doesn't exist. I, I think that uh, their children are very naturally philosophical from the very beginning, right? They ask reasonable questions like, where does God live? What is the soul? I mean, those are really tough. And so by the time you get older, you've been sort of conditioned not to ask those questions. And unsatisfactory answers have been uh, imposed upon you. Right? You know, the Lord works in mysterious ways. You know, you know all the sort of typical responses, right? But I think that there's a problem there in terms of the timeline because there are a lot of studies that show that children don't figure out causal reasoning, particularly in relation to these sort of metaphysical ways of looking at the world, until they're seven or eight years old, right? And so, I mean, a good example is uh, they had this uh, experimental setup where uh, they told these kids that were four and five, year, four and five years old that if um, 
they, they would they had to choose between box A and B, and under one of the boxes was a toy, and the other one there wasn't anything, right? And they didn't know which one. There was no data to select. And so if they chose the wrong box, they were told that God would give them a sign. Right? And so the four and five-year-olds, they'd go in there and they'd say they choose the wrong box, they choose A, and the sign was they'd rigged up a, rigged up a lamp to where it would flash, and would, that was supposed to be the subtle sign that God's saying, don't choose that box, and you're supposed to switch, and you get the toy, right? Well, the five-year-olds would never switch. They would point at the wrong box, they'd flash the light all day, and they would just never figure out that the light meant God was talking to them, and they were having interaction with God and change. By the time they got to be eight, the eight-year-olds would switch almost invariably. And so something happens in terms of our metaphysical causal reasoning somewhere around seven or eight. The problem is you start to instill moral values before that. And so when you try to come up with a rational, secular way of instilling moral values, well, it may be too late by the time you get seven or eight because they're going to pick up some of the fundamental moral behavior between four and seven years old. There's a, there's a window there. No. They learn that there are consequences to their actions. Like that person's not going to play with them anymore and they bonk you know, yeah. them in the head and stuff. Yeah. Right. But they may feel so good when they knock somebody in the head. You, that's where you have to say, look, I know you feel really good when you knocked him in the head. That felt awesome. But we need to focus on some of the other feelings that you have. Right. And so that's where it gets it gets kind of tricky. I mean, it also, yeah. obviously depends on the children's sentiment. And so two, on, so. kids have no concept of morality at all. They don't even have a concept of other minds at that point. Yeah. But by age about three, you can teach a kid elementary moral principles by saying things, Johnny, don't do that. Bobby, you wouldn't like it if Bobby did that to you. No, they don't have grand through, metaphysical principles of this classical conditioning yet. in some way. And yeah. they only develop them gradually, and they only reach full adult capabilities of making moral judgments when they are fully adult. Even teenagers don't typically make fully Almost adult decisions fully about decisions, morality. Yeah. But something has actually been working in the past few hundred years, because as we've shifted from having the overlying principle of what is right, what is wrong, from what it used to be of, well, disobedience to God is what is wrong, and obedience to God is what is right, which is no longer the principle. Now we actually have arguments from rationality to say, here is why these things are right. I don't think wrong. that's what's caused it, though. I think that's completely inaccurate. And it's not a personal attack. Well, I just think that's it, completely it, it's inaccurate. had a real strong effect. I, I, mean, don't, I don't think science from has had. Between the Middle Ages and today, the murder rate has dropped was by a factor, has I, dropped by a factor of 100. Similarly, with all kinds of. Yeah, we're of less violence. violent than we were back in the Middle Ages. I totally agree, but I think Christianity. And it has, well, I mean, in Roman it has times, think about this. Think about this. From the time that. It, the age of reason started saying, hey, you've got to have rational justifications for No, I, that's, I think that's totally off target. Law, I, I, look, in Roman times, good meant powerful, bad meant weak, right? And so Christians came along, and this, I'm just using Nietzsche's arguments, and these are very good sociological arguments. Then Christians come along, and they're part of the slave class, and so they invert the value system. Because you want good to mean frail and weak. The meek shall inherit the earth, turn the other cheek. Right? You've got to flip the value system over because you don't have any power. And so what you do is over several hundred years, you make the Romans feel guilty for what they're doing to you. You make them have guilt and conscience. Now, they had that fundamentally, I think, just as a result of evolution. But they didn't have the kind of sophisticated guilt and conscience that we in this room have. I mean, we all claim to be secular. We still feel bad about stuff. The Romans had the stomach for anything. And if you don't believe me, just read Roman history. I mean, just take a good example in warfare, right? This thing in Afghanistan would have been done in like three weeks with the Romans. They would have used low-yield nuclear weapons in the Suleiman mountain range. And they wouldn't give a damn about what happened in Pakistan. I mean, they had the entire, uh, they went into the city and killed everybody and sowed salt into the earth. So you can even come back there for 50 years and plant crops. Now, so, what so I'm it, saying is, is that so they didn't the feel like we do. We feel I bad because of Christianity and that tempered, so that, that, that temper, we are still all covert Christians. Christians. Christians were no better up until they lost power. And the way they lost power was humanists came along and said, your standard morality is wrong. Abolition is the right thing to do. And no Christian advocated abolition before the humanists did. I, I, I think that it, you're dismissing the psychological component, the guilt component. The Hunter-dweller men and women did not feel the kind of, they never felt guilty for having sex. They never felt guilty for chopping the head off of some competitor. They didn't have that. That came along with Christianity. We still have it today. For your behavior, it's a result of indoctrination into a culture that has a guilt model in it. 
Right? You're born fundamentally, even under that model, is guilty. As I say, it's the standard that changed. The standard changed from sin means disobedience to God, and good and right means obedience to God's law. It changed from that. I agree that's changed in, in, for rational people in some societies, particularly Western Europe, but that doesn't mean that that's the case in terms of our psychology. What I'm talking about is what really motivates you on a fundamental level. I think those are two different things. I can sit here and say, you know, I really ought not to feel guilty because of what I've done. Right? There's really no rational justification for it. I still feel it, though. Right? And so why do I feel that? Well, I mean, part of it's probably biological if it's the right kind of behavior, uh, but the other part, sociological, I think, on a fundamental level, which is traceable back to some Judeo-Christian model. And Christianity is not the only one that's had that model. I mean, there's a guilt uh, co concept in a lot of world religions. This has been a very interesting topic. I think everybody's made some really good points, but I was wondering if maybe we could circle back to meaning of life. Well, I feel I mean, like we're getting I really understand. stuck yeah. on, right. on but, morality. But it's the same thing, right? My point is, once again, we are still trying to find, I mean, uh, particularly Tom, he's been very diligent about making uh, the same argument in several different ways, right? <laughs> Um, and so I, my job as a philosopher is to try to counter those arguments if I think that they're not plausible and try to give mm -hmm. evidence. In the end, the point is exactly the same. Uh, we need to stop, as secular people, looking for meanings where there aren't any, right? They're not in science. They're not in morality. Uh, they're certainly not in uh, whatever religious system or pseudo-religious system is your favorite, right? Like aliens coming to save you, uh, there or Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster, whatever pseudo-system you have. You're not going to find meanings there. And if you do find them, like I said, I'll give you my cell number, call me immediately, and uh, we'll both go to some Ivy League institution. If you can find the right arguments to show where those sub-meanings are. And so, uh, in the end, is there, meaning, is there any meaning to life? No. Right? There's, there's not any meaning to life, unless it, there could be. I can imagine how it could, maybe, right? But uh, I don't see any evidence for it. And so if there are going to be any meanings, we are responsible for making them up piecemeal uh, at a, on a minute-by-minute -minute basis and being responsible and aware of that, ultimately. So. That's a very good point, but I don't know. I mean, we, there, there have been the discussions about how everything Everything we see, we smell, we touch is all from our perceptions. So since the perceptions, they're, they're built off of things that have influenced us and made us who we are, technically nothing is real or measurable and there is no meaning and there is nothing. Well, I mean, awesome. Evie. So Evie, if uh, you're to go that far, I, I feel like it, it ends you in a void where you do nothing. Well, I mean, I uh, mean. Push the rock up the hill, it falls back down, you push it up again. I mean, that's what you do. Is there any reason for pushing the rock? No. Is there a reason why the rock's there? No. For me, becoming secular, I did have to answer the questions of, this is where I received answers. What will be my new answers? And one of those answers was, you know, God is, God is a very sort of easy, I wish I had a better way of saying this, but like an easy scapegoat. It's easy to say, you know, it's, it's not my fault this happened to me because, you know, God, this is what God wants me to do. You know, this is where he wants me to be. And that, that was, for me, that, that was very much how it was. Right. And then when I became secular, I took that control. You know, they talk about external and internal locus of control. And I developed an internal locus of control. I think the meaning moves too. When you take the control from God and you put it back in yourself and you say, I have control of my life, I think you then establish your own meanings based off of your environment and the people around you and what has made you who you are. So I don't really think that means that there is, I mean, there is no meaning in a philosophical way, but we make meaning. So there is. I'm fine with that, right? I mean, you into the same place that I'm articulating too. I mean, if you go back to your original problem about sense perception and subjectivity and so on, and uh, that we're conditioned by our environment to respond to stimuli in various ways, I mean, this whole thing can fall apart even, even in a deeper level if we start worrying about free will and uh, things like that, uh, because the arguments for free will are really slippery and not particularly compelling. And if there is free will, it's probably in a very little, narrow window. And so you certainly can lose meaning that way too. Because if I'm just this really complicated automaton <coughs> bounced around via stimuli, uh, you know, to have some sort of deep structural meaning, ultimately. Automatons that 
Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Which is frustrating. It's just frustrating that that's there. Yeah. Between yeah. an automaton yeah. that, that, or, or something that's not an automaton that believes they have free will, and being yeah. an automaton who believes he has free will. Well, I'd rather be an automaton that actually has free will and believes that he doesn't have free will. That's what I'd rather be, yeah. right? But I, I don't. Can you make the case? The, yeah. the mechanisms of free will exists. I mean, the the internal mechanisms. You form purposes in your mind. Well, I don't know if you formed them. I mean, those are those are those are external. Yeah, they formed. Let's say, let's yeah, exactly. Say, uh, you for, your mind does have purposes. Yeah. You do pursue actions in order to accomplish those purposes. Right, which is even more frustrating, though, given her comment. Right, I mean, if that's a, but, uh, if that's a result of an external stimuli, so, then you don't even get the choice to form the teleology that you think is. Construct. Does that make yeah. sense? In other words, why you like X, Y, and Z as a result of all these conditions and past well, uh, events that were beyond your control in the first. But that doesn't that doesn't negate so. the the mechanism for, of free will and purpose. I well, mean, but it doesn't show me that there is a mechanism. Say, of free I mean, will even either. even if there is, I mean, at least at the present time, we don't have any. Uh, our be, our best physical theories cur currently are probabilistic. They're not deterministic. But that doesn't give you free will. The, Probability and free will. Right. Are the same okay. Thing. But yeah. the thing is that so we don't have a, at least the the best theories we have are not completely deterministic, but they're statistically. Uh, yeah. Statistical quantum theories. Mechanics is particularly right. right. Quantum yeah. mechanics yeah. is at least at the present time a statistical theory, but. Um, but I, I don't feel any better. I don't find any solace in that I'm a statistically regulated being as opposed to a, uh, a deterministic being. I want to be a free being. I want one that has volition, that I can, uh, from uh, agent causation, I can break from the causal chain of the past and make whatever new causal chain that I want within the boundaries of physical law. And uh, that, that would be a way maybe of finding some deeper meaning to our purpose if we knew that we genuinely had free will, but uh, the arguments there are really slippery. They're, I mean, think what has to happen for you to have free will and to have that sort of deep structure and meaning and reality. You'd have to either be able to change the past conditions of the universe or change the laws of physics or both, and we can't do any of that. And so how can I be free if I can't do either of those things, ultimately? You're, you're, you're and so, demanding a, a standard of free will that's the mythology that comes from the Middle That's free Peter Bannonwagon's argument from 1980, actually. Right, People so, really yeah. do make choices. There's no question about that. We know from brain studies that what people think they do of making conscious choices <clears throat> is not really true. Yeah, that's true for sure. We have subconscious processes going on before those conscious things ever happen. So in some sense, the old notion of what free will is is just flat wrong. Well, I mean, it is volitional. It's I mean, you you want want right. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so going based on what you were talking about with the individual determining the meaning, I want to dovetail that with what we were talking about earlier about the narrative and the language that we use. We're talking about meaning of life. Right. We're not talking about the motive in life. What would be the motive in life? Her motive might be one that's in the best interest of the well-being of her. Mr. CEO here, his motive may be bilking his 401k plan. Right. So what is the motive in life? And that's not necessarily what we're touching upon. Is that motive in the best interest of people? Is it in their self-interest? And where does that cross the line into something that's detrimental? We're not talking motive here. Maybe that's something well, we I need to take that, a look at. I think at. that the way, to, I would, the way I would look at that personally is that the motive and the meaning become the same thing. That uh, there's no distinction there. And so whatever... Whatever motive, whatever you're motivated to do, that's what your meaning is at that particular time. But see, motive is amoral just as much as meaning is amoral. Yeah. I, well, I'm not. I, remember, I'm arguing that there aren't any moral facts at all, so I'm I'm fine with that layer. Yeah. I, I mean, we can make up systems that work and guide us, but there aren't moral facts in in the significant sense, ultimately. So, okay. Yeah. Thank you for coming, and this has been a great discussion. I hate to shut it down, but we've been going for almost two hours, yeah. guys. <laughs> Can you believe this? This is like my dream class, right? If, if only I had all these people. Uh, I mean, I can always find somebody to argue with, no matter whether they're secular or religious and so on. So usually I'm having religious arguments for two hours, right? But uh, I had a good secular argument. I appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me. So. Um, I would like to invite you to come to Socrates Cafe. 
because we have a philosophical discussion group. This, this, um, we, we sponsor it with the library system. Okay. Rudy's the one that I told you to look out for. He runs it. And he, and he really didn't say a single thing. You. Didn't say a single thing. I'm speaking yeah, for yeah. him right now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> he's banned. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's been banned. <laughs> no, that's it's not true. It's a discriminatory true, organization, right? It's a, you have because to have, Socrates uh, wanted it that way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I I understand. <laughs> it's been a okay. good conversation, though. Everyone, good, good, uh, very good. If thank only you for every being class here. I like it. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for being here.